Trenton Chase, a killer with a lust for blood, would become known as the Vampire of Sacramento. He wants to explore the body. He wants to drink her blood. A man who murdered and mutilated indiscriminately. Most serial killers don't do random killings. Created terror in a community. Everybody was very upset in the neighborhood, starting talking about buying guns. And pushed the cops to their limits. I had it in my mind already that if the baby was there, I was going to kill Chase. But was Richard Chase a born killer or a product of his environment? Richard Trenton Chase was born on May 23, 1950 in Sacramento. In many respects, his childhood was ordinary. It was considered to be the typically 1950 dysfunctional family, which means that there was a lot of arguing, there was some physical abuse, but not to the extent that it was out of the norm of the culture at that time. As children at that time were very frequently beaten, uh, and it was just considered that's how you discipline your child. There doesn't seem to be any severe physical abuse. There doesn't seem to be any severe difficulties beyond the arguing between his parents and the typical discipline of the day. However, one aspect of Chase's childhood offered a glimpse of things to come. The young boy had a taste for harming and killing cats. The torturing of animals is probably something that most normal uh, children go through. Why it becomes significant in relation to serial killers is that whilst most children develop a conscience through their relationship with animals, uh, they realize that they're actually hurting the animal. And of course, if you are continuing to torture, mutilate animals, you really haven't learned to develop the conscience in the way that children normally develop their conscience as they grow older. Richard Chase, nevertheless, went to school in that area and uh, for a time at least uh, was considered to be uh, conventionally dressed and, and able to fit in to some degree you know, with the other students. Uh, in other words, he didn't uh, act totally weird, uh, just only in certain areas uh, when he was very young. At high school in the mid-1960s, Chase began experimenting with drugs, taking marijuana and LSD. He began using extremely heavy doses of not only marijuana but other drugs. Can a drug precipitate someone to go over the edge? Um, I mean, just out of the blue, can you become psychotic without having some underlying disease? The tendency is to say that if you don't have some type of a vulnerability or a sensitivity, the number of people who took LSD here in this country and everywhere in the world, we would have had a number of serial murderers running around. So it seems that he had some underlying difficulties, but could it have precipitated the murders? Not in and of itself. Alongside his spiraling drug use, the teenage Chase had developed a physical problem. He discovered there was a difference in his life from his peers in that whilst he was attracted to women, he wasn't able to uh, achieve erection. He began to think that somehow uh, since the blood is supposed to go into the penis to make it hard as we all know that uh, if he got blood from some external source as a kind of a supplement uh, that that might do the trick by the time chase was in his twenties his behavior and beliefs were becoming increasingly bizarre he thought he, he was being poisoned 
He thought he had bones growing out of the back of his head. He thought his stomach was upside down. His pulmonary artery had been stolen. And uh, he was in great physical pain. It was all imagined, of course. He began to address ways to alleviate that pain. And what he did was he began to kill small animals and use their blood and, and body parts. Chase was committed to the Beverly Manor Psychiatric Hospital, where his extreme behavior caused fellow patients to nickname him Dracula. Richard Chase now is doing uh, things with small animals, animals and birds, you know, killing them, drinking their blood. He needed extensive care. He was not receiving as much care as he should have gotten. Despite the concerns of some staff, Chase was discharged into the care of his now separated parents. His disturbing behavior continued unabated, including killing a cat in front of his mother. One time the mother came in and saw him ripping, a, I guess, a pet apart and rubbing the blood on his face, that type of thing. And she didn't report it. But the killing of cats was just the beginning for Richard Trenton Chase. I think one of the interesting developments in relation to Chase's journey to become a serial killer was what happened in August 1977 in Pyramid Lake, which is an Indian reservation. On a routine patrol, officers from the Bureau of Indian Affairs had noticed a pickup truck stuck in the sand. Looking inside the vehicle, they made a shocking discovery. In the pickup, there's lots of blood stains, some rifles, and gruesomely, there's a bucket. Uh, in the bucket was a liver. And of course, at that point, uh, they were wondering if there had been some kind of a homicide. The officers scanned the area with field glasses. They tried to discover uh, who might be responsible for this dreadful scene of carnage. Perched on a rock about half a mile away, they spotted an unclothed figure that immediately bolted in the opposite direction. He's totally naked, um, blood smeared over his body. So they were just certain he'd kill somebody, so they arrested him. The man identified himself as Richard Trenton Chase, age 27, of Sacramento. And he claimed the blood that covered his body and his vehicle was his own, and it seeped out of him. While Chase was in custody, the liver and blood were tested. They'd come from a cow. Chase was released without charge. Then, at the end of 1977, after years of hunting animals, Chase graduated to more serious game. In a peaceful suburban neighborhood outside of Sacramento, 51-year-old Ambrose Griffin had suddenly dropped dead without warning. His wife's first thoughts were a heart attack. The truth was far more sinister. Lieutenant Ray Biondi was the chief of homicide for the city's sheriff's department and in charge of the case. In December 1977, this was the Ambrose Griffin house. And it's a very, as you can see, a very quiet neighborhood, uh, middle class neighborhood. But Mr. Griffin was unloading groceries from the trunk of his car and walking towards the front door when a passing car went by and someone shot him from that car. Shot him in his own front yard. There were no obvious suspects. We uh, did a background on Mr. Griffin and we couldn't find a reason that anybody would want to harm him. And there was little in the way of clues. 
Frank Davidson was the CSI officer called to the scene. Well, there wasn't much evidence to pick up at the crime scene. But the next day, a couple of shell casings were found down the street. We uh, assumed that it was just a thrill killing. Somebody wanted to shoot a person in their own front yard. We thought there was some kid shooting the street lights or something, you know. No one ever thought of anything like Richard Jay's. More shots from the murder weapon had been fired seemingly indiscriminately into other homes in the neighborhood. It's unusual because most serial killers are hands-on people. They don't use weapons that frequently. Um, they may, you know, have one, but they don't use it for their killings. So this makes him somewhat unusual in the profile. Richard Trenton Chase had taken his first human life. And the murder of Ambrose Griffin was merely the start of a spree that would shock this city to its core. In December 1977, serial killer Richard Trenton Chase committed his first known murder, shooting 51-year-old Ambrose Griffin as he unloaded his groceries in suburban Sacramento. We uh, assumed that it was just a thrill killing. Somebody wanted to shoot a person in their own front yard. The seemingly random nature of the murder left detectives with few clues. We thought there was some kid shooting the street lights or something, you know. No one ever thought of anything like Richard Chase. In January 1978, Chase was again displaying puzzling behavior. Residents of Sacramento's East Area were reporting a prowler entering backyards and homes. At one residence, the disheveled intruder was interrupted and chased from the scene. The house was a shambles. Chase had urinated into a drawer of baby's clothes and defecated on a child's bed. This is the behavior of somebody who wants to utterly claim control over the particular scene, that particular house in which he has invaded. This is the behavior of a man who is showing his contempt for the people who live there. Ultimately, he's not thinking clearly. He's not thinking rationally. On January 23rd, 1978, Chase struck again. This time, it was no simple drive-by shooting. Rookie detective Wayne Irie found himself drawn into the investigation. I had been uh, just recently promoted to detective and had been assigned to the uh, metro unit which worked primarily misdemeanor crimes so I had been a detective maybe four or five months not very long we got a call to respond to assist in a homicide on Tioga Way we were advised in that the victim was found in the residence and that she had been, they believe, shot and had been opened up with a knife. You'd almost want to say butchered. Homicide chief Ray Biondi was one of the first on the scene and quickly spotted a sinister calling card. The first thing we noticed before even going in the house was a unexpended 22 caliber shell that was in the mailbox. But nothing could have prepared him for what was inside. Uh, had you stepped right inside the front door, there was garbage scattered on the floor. And an obvious drag mark that went from the front room back into the master bedroom. There on the floor was Teresa Wallen. She was dead, and she had been mutilated. Her abdominal region had been cut open. The clothing is pulled up over her chest. Uh, her legs are spread apart, 
you know, without garments, like it was in a rape or something. He had made an incision down the center of the stomach and that's an angle, and uh, apparently had been moving the intestines and internal organs around. It was a horrific homicide because not only had he killed her, but she was pregnant at the time, so he killed an unborn child. I found a used yogurt cup, a, pl a paper cup, the yogurt came in, which had zigzag prints on it, and apparently he had, had been drinking the blood or doing something with the blood in that cup. The extraordinary scene was unlike anything the officers had encountered before. At the time, we were thinking we're dealing with somebody who, uh, a psychopath, obviously, because of the way he mutilated the bodies. I've been to a lot of homicide scenes, and took a lot of pictures and a lot of evidence, and he was the strangest I've ever seen, you know, or a lot of the other people I've ever seen, so. You don't have everybody, every day someone's cutting somebody open, looking through intestines and, and uh, moving their things about. The crime scene showed signs of what the FBI had recently begun classifying as a disorganized killer. This was a disorganized type individual who committed disorganized uh, type crimes. Uh, crimes that would be not logical, that would reflect poor planning, that would reflect rage, that would reflect uh, uh, elements that uh, could be read by the, the individual investigating the crime. Chase's first victim had been shot and left where he fell. The mutilation of Teresa Wallen signaled a dramatic escalation of violence. Here we've got the first human uh, example of what Chase has been doing to animals for a very long period of time. Teresa Wallen was effectively mutilated. Um, her internal organs were uh, removed, looked at, experimented with. But remember also, we have to go back to what we know about Chase from a very young age. He had erectile dysfunction. And therefore, whilst he might be sexually attracted to women, he can't express that sexual attraction in any way which is normal. So the way that this is manifesting itself is in relation to how badly abused her body is. He's curious about her internal organs. He's curious about her breasts. He's curious about her vagina. And of course, the way he expresses that curiosity is to desecrate and destroy. It's very similar characteristic among serial killers, and he's certainly not uh, alone in this, where they have no human emotions. So to them, a human being that they may have killed is just an object to be experimented upon, very similar to the laboratory animals that are used in experimentation. And it seems to be almost a very unusual childlike curiosity. So the serial murderer frequently will treat his victim as if they were just a very experimental piece of meat. With a psychotic killer on the loose, the detectives needed to act fast. It's always a race against time. When, when on a homicide, the first 24 hours are the very most critical, the next, the 72 hours. And anything after that starts becoming cold. You have a problem developing your leads. All your leads, your witnesses are going to come forward if you can find them and knock on the doors within the first 72 hours. I was going door to door to talk to anybody, to knock on doors, to uh, find out if anybody had seen anything. And in fact, one of the, uh, the neighbors that I talked to had seen Richard Trenton Chase. And then we didn't know who it was, but described the, uh, the white male subject in the clothing that he walked across this gentleman's front porch toward Teresa Wallen's house. As the news of the murder spread, so did the fear hit the papers the next day and everybody you know was very upset in the neighborhood starting to talking about buying guns that type of thing I think the difference in this case was the horrendous nature of the, the victim 
Teresa Wall was taking the garbage out. She was pregnant. She was shot and gutted. And I saw a photograph of her and the fear on her face in death. I see that to this day. What the residents and detectives of Sacramento didn't realize was that Chase was about to strike again, and this time with even more ferocity. January 1978, serial killer Richard Trenton Chase had struck twice in suburban Sacramento. First, the mysterious drive-by shooting of 51-year-old Ambrose Griffin. We uh, assumed that it was just a thrill killing. Somebody wanted to shoot a person in their own front yard. Then the shocking murder of three-month pregnant Teresa Wallen. As fear spread in the community, a large task force was mobilized in a race to apprehend the unknown killer before he struck again. Everybody was very upset in the neighborhood, starting to talk about buying guns, that type of thing. Then, on January 27, 1978, Homicide Chief Ray Biondi received the call that three more bodies had been found. When I went into this house on Marywood, it was obvious that uh, this was something very similar to what happened on Teresa Wallen, uh, murder on Tyre Go Away. In the front room was Daniel Meredith. He had been shot in the head, and he obviously had been executed where he was probably standing. As I went into a back bedroom, there was Evelyn Marath. She had been killed and mutilated. Her abdominal cavity had been opened. And at first I didn't notice, but then I did notice on the other side of the bed was her young five-year-old son, who was also had been uh, shot in the head. There was a bathtub full of bloody water and we had this whole house of carnage, actually, and 22 casings. And we were very confident we were dealing with the same killer. There was similarities as to the Tioga Way murder, in which the victims had been cut open and their organs had been removed, some of them, as well as the blood. and. The female victim had actually been sodomized also in this case. As a young man, Chase had struggled with sexual relations, but here, something had changed. Erectile dysfunction is not unusual among serial murderers, even though they are capable very frequently of having some sexual intercourse when the victim is dead. Some serial killers will be act focused other serial killers will be processed focused by act focused i mean that the psychological need for the killer to kill is achieved simply by the death of the victim the killer will do nothing to the victim's body because he's achieved what it is that he wants to achieve on the other hand a processed focused serial killer will want to spend time with the body of his victim and that's very common in relation to what uh, Chase did with Therese Wallen and what he would do with Evelyn Moroth. He wants to explore the body. He wants to drink her blood. He wants to engage with the body in a sexual way. And the longer he's able to stay with the victim, the longer he's able to sustain uh, some feeling of sexual satisfaction. While there were many similarities with the previous murder of Teresa Wallen, the police were now facing a new urgent factor. They knew a 22-month-old boy had been in the house, but he was nowhere to be found. 
What really upset us and, and the urgency was that David Farrar, the little two-year-old boy, was missing. Police and public were mobilized in this search for the infant. We had many volunteers, citizen volunteers and people within the department who were searching to try to find this baby. But the random nature of the killings meant few clues, and terror was growing throughout the community. With five people murdered and an infant missing, police in Sacramento were desperate for clues. Nobody knew who was going to be next. Innocent people killed and mutilated in their own homes. Most serial killers don't do random killings. Again, they have a pattern and they generally follow the pattern of the victim, not necessarily the method. But he was an individual who just killed indiscriminately. But as the police continued to canvass the neighborhood, it became clear that the killer had been seen. People kept telling us that they saw this strange looking individual. He was a white male, maybe six foot tall, wearing a bright orange parka, very scraggly hair, very thin, very emaciated looking, who had actually peered into people's houses. Despite having a good visual description of the potential suspect, the law enforcement agencies were struggling to identify him. There were other sightings of white males, 20s, long hair, but that in those days was not unusual. I mean, we're talking about back in the era of the, the hippies, the, the long hair was the in thing to have. Everybody was having long hair at that time. Then the detectives got a break. A girl who'd gone to high school with Richard Chase saw an artist's sketch of the suspect. She remembered an encounter she'd had at the town and country shopping center on the day of Teresa Wallen's murder. She saw this uh, figure, you know, totally dirty, long hair, smudges here and there and everywhere, and a blank look, you know, just a strange looking fellow. The problem is that she was a student with him in high school, and she didn't recognize him. So he came up to her, and she's a little bit frightened by now, of course, uh, because of the appearance, and he asked her if she remembered a certain fellow who was killed in high school on a motorcycle. And she says, well, who are you? And he says, uh, Rick Chase. He spooked her so bad that she basically jumped in the car, locked the doors, and drove away. Didn't think any more about it until she actually saw the sketch later in the week. Rookie detective Wayne Irie was handed the job of questioning the witness. She described his jacket, which was the orange-colored snow jacket, the same as the jacket the gentleman saw him wearing when he was walking toward Teresa Wallace's residence. And then Nancy Holden told me that she thought he had blood on his hands. A background check revealed Chase's previous brushes with the law, including the strange incident at Pyramid Lake. It also provided an address. Emotions among the detectives were running high as they set off to confront the man they suspected of killing five people and kidnapping a 22-month-old boy. On the way out here, Detective Roberts and Ken Baker and myself were convinced that Richard Chase was our killer. I had it in my mind already that if the baby was there, I was going to kill Chase. That was it. That's thoughts the cops aren't supposed to have, but this guy was bizarre. And that's it, you know, we would just execute this guy on the scene. When we arrived at the apartment complex, we parked in the lot here and went in to make contact with the manager. 
she confirmed that he was in apartment 15. So detectives Baker, Roberts, and myself knocked on the door of apartment 15. There was no response. Knock, 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 no response. There was a vacant apartment next door to his. Uh, Ken Baker went inside, listened to the wall. We could hear movement inside the apartment. We, at that point, did not have a warrant for the apartment. We didn't have an arrest warrant. So I asked Bill Roberts to go back to the managed apartment, call Ray Deonde, our supervisor, ask him for some advice. You know, we were new detectives, you know. While they waited for word from their supervisor, the detectives took up new positions. The sudden silence led Chase to believe they'd given up their search. Chase did, in fact, think we were leaving. He came out with his box full of rags. He looked, he saw me, and he started running. At the time, he's looking back over his shoulder as I'm chasing him. He gets down here to 14. This is where Detective Baker was. Smacked him on the head. Ken knocked him down. And then we jumped on him, wrestled around with him. Irie and his colleague were now gripped in a violent struggle with a man who had killed and mutilated indiscriminately, and he was armed. His gun was in a holster underneath the jacket on his chest. I pulled my service revolver out, I stuck it in his ear, I told him to quit fighting or I was going to blow his brains out. Well, he didn't quit fighting, and that's when I found out I'm not like him. Even though I believe that it would have been a good shooting, it would have been a justified shooting, I couldn't kill him, and I would have been justified in doing it. Because the average person, cops included, are not like these people. He's a cold-blooded killer, and we aren't. The detectives finally managed to overpower the suspect without a shot being fired. As Chase was taken into custody, detectives entered apartment 15 looking for the missing baby, David Ferreira. Just nearly every surface in the apartment was covered with blood. The couch was covered with blood, uh, the kitchen counter, the sink, and the bathroom, uh, on the carpet. Uh, there were strange looking uh, substance in jars in this refrigerator. In a blender there was what appeared to have been organs, maybe animal or, or human. Uh, might have even been mixed with Coca-Cola. But the missing baby was nowhere to be found. On January 28, 1978, serial killer Richard Trenton Chase was apprehended fleeing his apartment in Sacramento. Behind him was a trail of murder and mutilation that left five dead and a 22-month-old infant, David Ferreira, missing. A search of his apartment had revealed evidence of his guilt. The couch was covered with blood, uh, the kitchen counter, the sink, and the bathroom. In a blender, there was what appeared to have been organs, maybe animal or, or human. But there was no sign of the missing child. As the detective who made the arrest, Wayne Irie was given the opportunity to interrogate Chase first. During the interrogation, he admitted to killing dogs. I tried every little trick I could, but he would never admit to killing people. And then I turned to lay some more photographs out, and when I looked back like this, Chase's head was right here, right next to my shoulder startled me. When I did it, I turned back, his head is here. What the hell are you doing? Well, that did, that shut that man up right there. Now, as I become more experienced, I believe now, if I would have put my arm around him, I could see the tears welling up in his eyes, he would have cracked and confessed. I believe that in my heart. Irie had failed to get a confession or information on the whereabouts of the infant, David Ferreira. Prosecuting attorney Ronald Tochterman 
Join new detectives in the next wave of questioning. Some of his responses suggested that he was delusional. People were out to get him. He might have mentioned the Nazis or the Italians. Those were recurring things. When he was advised, he said he wanted an attorney. And I remember then I intervened and I said, well, theoretically, he has the right to um, refuse to answer. We, we are supposed to stop questioning him at this point, but I'm going to, going to persist because at that point, the baby was still unfound. We didn't know where the baby was. So I did question him, but he was... He would, he would not acknowledge anything. He was not forthcoming at all. It would be almost two months before the whereabouts of the infant were finally discovered. Several months, in fact, in March of 1978, we found or discovered where David Ferrer was. What had happened is the caretaker at this church had discovered the body in a cardboard box in this void area between the buildings. The body was badly decomposed. His head was decapitated, but all the remains and his clothing were in, within this box. And so this was the scene after months and months of uh, diligent searching for the body. Richard Trenton Chase had claimed the lives of six innocent people. In 1979, he would be tried for his crimes. Defense attorney Ferris Salome entered a plea of insanity. The whole case with Richard Chase was one of mental disease. He uh, was about 27 or 8 years old when I met him in the jail. That was a day or two at the most after he was arrested. I got the opinion very soon, I don't know how quickly, but he's the most deranged fellow I ever met. The prosecution, however, were confident that Chase had known right from wrong when he had committed the murders. And so was technically sane in the eyes of California law. The stuff that was found in his house was very very incriminating and I remember approaching the trial with the idea that um, it wasn't going to be much of a challenge to convince a jury that he was the one who killed these people the, the uh, challenge was going to be to convince them that he was legally sane when he killed the people and then ultimately when we got to the penalty phase that the appropriate punishment was death on the stand Chase admitted to drinking his victim's blood and to decapitating the infant in order to obtain more. He said he thought it would be therapeutic. Chase described himself as a good person, although weak in heart and mind. To be insane means you, you uh, don't know the nature of what you've done. You don't understand the nature of uh, your offense, and you don't uh, know how to distinguish it right from wrong. Most people that do these horrific things, they know that they're doing something wrong, so you, the, the public thinks, well, anyone who would do something like that must be crazy, but no. Uh, <laughs> they may be cruel, but they're not crazy. He did a lot of things, which the prosecution will tell you, that show that he was thinking. You know, he took rubber gloves with him to protect himself. But he never, on the other hand, he never cleaned himself up. People saw this blood on him all the time. He never got a haircut. He wandered in and out of people's yards. Uh, he never seemed to be, to be trying to conceal this appearance, which is kind of the other side of it. But would the jury judge him to have been insane? difference between life and death. In May 1979, they delivered their verdict. Within 10 days, Richard Chase will be taken from the jail here to San Quentin State Prison, where he will be housed on condemned row. Richard Trenton Chase was found guilty of first-degree murder and was sentenced to death.
But what had driven Chase to commit his appalling crimes? Was he a born killer, or had something in his upbringing turned him into one? If he was um, abused at all, it may have been by his father with the belt, you know, for some of his outrageous actions. However, uh, I would have to say that uh, that wouldn't make somebody crazy. The truly brutalized uh, young people, real cruelty and consistent humiliation, all of those things are very important factors nudging the person in the direction of uh, later violence or crime, but you don't make somebody schizophrenic that way. If Chase had suffered no abuse, was his future as a serial killer rooted in neglect? This man was a schizophrenic, a paranoid schizophrenic, and I feel it's a tragedy that he wasn't given the help that would have stopped him from killing uh, other fellow human beings. What was striking to me about the mother is that when one time uh, he um, like knocked on her door and you know, she heard a noise or something, and there he was, and he had a dead, he was holding a dead cat, and blood was smeared all over, uh, she didn't do anything. I think once you are beginning to torture animals on a regular basis, then simply you're learning that for yourself that you are able to do this. You become desensitized to the pain that another sentient being has uh, at your hands and therefore you become socialized into imagining that how you are behaving is acceptable behavior. It is but a short step to then feel that they are able to engage in the same types of behavior, not with animals, but with other human beings. I think the best way to understand Chase from a diagnostic standpoint uh, is that he was schizophrenic, and that then he uh, suffered serious breakdown in adolescence because of the aggravation of his uh, genetic potential by uh, these, um, as we say, psychotomimetic or hallucinogenic drugs. No human being is immune to the genetic background that they bring and the environmental issues that work on them. Was it that he had that gene mutation acted on by the familial history, by the drugs, and by the disappointment he had in his relationships. Obviously, he must have been born to kill, but the factors that added on to that change when he was an adolescent, when everything in the brain changes, we don't know the answer to that yet.